we are week three into our I Am series. We have been looking at Jesus' statements about who he is. We saw that he said, I am the bread of life. He said, I am the light of the world. And today we will be in John chapter 10. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. John chapter 10. As you do that, I'm going to start by (laughs) sharing an embarrassing story. I'm just going to lay it out there. This is a story, hey, teenagers, this is a story from when I was 13. And I was in youth group, and our youth group went to an amusement park. And I didn't want to carry my bag and my jacket around all day. And the amusement park had a a room with lockers that you could store your stuff when you didn't want to carry it. So I decided I'm going to put my jacket and my bag in one of the lockers so that I can go have fun. So I walk in there, and, you know, this is in the olden days when there was no tap to pay or, you know, swipe this. Yeah, You actually had to use quarters. And so the lockers would only accept quarters. It was 75 cents. Three quarters, that's what you had to have if you wanted to use one of the lockers. So I walk into the the locker area, and as I walk in, my 13-year-old self spies a really cute boy. And he's standing in front of one of the lockers. I know my daughter is probably mortified right now. He's standing in front of one of the lockers, putting stuff in a locker. So, you know, naturally, I... I find myself going to one of the lockers that's two lockers down from this cute boy. And, and I'm so aware, you know, that you're, how good your peripheral vision can be. You know, I'm looking at the locker, but I'm actually looking at the cute boy who's standing, you know, two feet away from me. And so I pull out my three quarters and I, you know, trying to be super casual. And I put, I go to put the quarter in and it won't go in. I, you know, it, I don't know what's wrong. I, I kind of, I, and then, you know, I kind of look and he looks and there's a smile, you know, we made eye contact, but I'm, I'm trying to put this quarter in the little slot and it just won't go in. So I kind of, you know, <laughs> very casually just step one over and, you know, haha, you know, and go to put my quarter in and seriously, it won't go in the slot. And I'm, I, and then I'm starting to get a little bit flustered and I kind of glance around and there are tons of people putting quarters into the slots and putting their stuff away. And I'm standing there trying to get my quarter in and the quarter won't fit the, the little slot. It's like it's too small. So I, I'm getting really flustered at this point and it's, you know, eye contact with the cute boy and ha ha ha. And I move to the third locker and I try, try to put it in and it won't go in. And at this point, I want the ground to swallow me up because I know there's a way into that locker. Everybody else seems to have a way in, but I can't get there. And the cute boy knows it. He's watching the whole thing. And then... To my mortification, he kind of saunters over with his cute boyness, and <laughs> and he goes, "Let me help you." And he opens the door, and that's when I realize the door covers half the slot, and you have to open the door to even have access, you know, to the whole thing. So, I mean, I tell you, I shoved my stuff in there and ran and prayed on my way out that I wouldn't run into that guy the entire day. I did not want to see that cute boy anymore. But think about that. Has there ever been a place in your life where you're wanting access into something and you can't quite get there? Maybe it's, you know, there's this group of friends. Maybe you're new to this church and you have yet to figure out how do I get connected? How do I get in into a place where I have relationship and connection? I want it, but I'm not quite sure how to get in there. Or maybe it's a career field. You, you went to school for something specific and then you go to apply for jobs and you can't seem to get into the thing that you were created and trained to do and you're trying and you're applying and it seems like everybody else knows the right way to interview or the right thing to do or they have just the right experience and they have access but you don't have access. Maybe, 
Maybe you can remember a time in your life, or maybe it's even right now, where you look around at people who seem to have access to God in a way that you long for. That, that you're thinking, I need to get to God. I need to be close to God. I know he's got the answer, but, but you can't seem to figure it out. And everybody else seems to know how to get to him, how to access the blessings of God, how to access that relationship that they talk about. But you can't seem to gain that same access. If you find yourself there today, to anybody who ever finds themselves looking for access to God and not knowing how to get it, John chapter 10, Jesus says, I am the door. I am the way in. If you are longing to have access to the things of God, if you are longing to have access to a relationship with God, if you are longing to be part of God's family, Jesus says, look no further. I am the door. I am the way in. And we see in John chapter 10, we're going to read starting in verse 7. There's a, there is a whole lot that Jesus says about this, but we're just going to focus on a couple of verses here. Verse seven, Jesus says to the people he's speaking to, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. It's interesting because he says I'm the door, but he specifies I'm the door of the sheep. And the idea of shepherds and sheep is really prevalent in scripture. It's really prevalent all throughout the Bible. The fathers of, of the Christian faith, of the Jewish faith, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they were shepherds. Moses was a shepherd. King David was a shepherd. And, and you'll see if you read the Bible that there are many places where it, it pictures God as a shepherd and his people as his sheep. Verses like Psalm 78, 52. Then he led his people like sheep and guided them in the wilderness like a flock. Shepherding was in the day and age when Jesus was saying these things, when he said, I am the door of the sheep, shepherding and sheep, that was a normal part of life. To say that the people that were listening to Jesus talking, to say that they had an understanding of shepherding would be an understatement. Every, everybody, even if they were not a shepherd, saw it. All day in, in their everyday life. It was a normal part of life. And if they weren't a shepherd, they probably knew a shepherd. But for us today, I don't know. I, I'm making a guess here. Do we have any shepherds in the room? Anyone spent some time in the fields with some sheep this weekend? I don't know. No? Yeah. So, so even though they knew, and as soon as he starts painting this picture, they had a full understanding, uh, or at least they could, uh, they could catch the picture he was trying to make with his words. But we maybe are thinking, so Jesus says he's the door of the sheep. Okay. <laughs> What does that mean for me? Well, shepherds in that day, they would, uh, when talking about a door, there were two, two sort of pictures. The first is if a shepherd had his sheep, had his flock near the village, near the town where he lived, oftentimes there would be a communal um, corral, a communal sheepfold where, where multiple shepherds would bring their flocks 
and the sheep would all go into this this enclosure together and there was a gate and there was a gatekeeper and the shepherd when he needed his sheep would come to the gate the gatekeeper would open the shepherd would call his special call to his sheep and the sheep knew their shepherd and only the sheep that belonged to that shepherd would come and follow him out that's if they were in town now Often they would take, the shepherds would take the sheep to pasture. They would take them out into the hills, into the fields, and then they were not together and it would just be the shepherd and his sheep. And will you throw the picture up there? And so, so they would often look for places, uh, a cave or somewhere in a, in a, on the side of a hill that was sort of hollowed out. And then the shepherds would take rocks and build a wall so that they could keep the sheep safe, particularly at night when it was dark and when there would be predators around. And there's this really cool story. Uh, there's a guy, he was a Scottish Old Testament scholar in, who was born in the mid-1800s. His name was Sir George Adam Smith. He was traveling, and you can leave that, go ahead and leave that picture up there for a little bit. So he was traveling through the Middle East with a guide. And as they were traveling, they came across something like this. And there was a shepherd with his sheep nearby. And so Sir George stopped to ask the shepherd some questions. And this is an account of what happened. The shepherd showed him the fold into which the sheep were led at night. It consisted of, of four walls with a way in. Sir George said to the shepherd, this is where they go at night? Yes, said the shepherd. And when they are in there, they are perfectly safe. But there is no door, said Sir George. I am the door, said the shepherd. He was not a Christian man. He was not speaking in the language of the New Testament. He was speaking from the Arab shepherd's standpoint. Sir George looked at him and said, what do you mean by the door? Said the shepherd, when the light has gone and all the sheep are inside, I lie in the open space and no sheep ever goes out but across my body and no wolf comes in unless he crosses my body. I am the door. And Jesus said, I am the door. I am the way in to be part of God's protected people. Access to God and everything that he offers is through Jesus. Interesting, isn't it, that he laid down his body to be the door for people to access God. Ephesians 3.12 says, we have confidence and access to God in him in full assurance through his faithfulness. Romans 5.2 through him, we have been allowed to approach by faith into his grace in which we stand. Now, in, in the practice of our faith, there's a lot of flexibility about a lot of things. What kind of worship music you prefer and what kind of worship music I prefer, there's a lot of flexibility in that. Whether we do communion every month or every week, there's a lot of flexibility in that. Whether you get up early in the morning to read your Bible and journal and talk to the Lord, or you like to do that at night before you go to bed, there's a lot of flexibility in a lot of things. But in this, there is no flexibility. Jesus said, I am the door. I am the door. Not I am one of many doors. I am the door. If there is only one door into a given space, 
then people choose whether or not to enter in through that door or to stay outside. Now, for those who choose to enter in through Jesus to access a relationship with God, what is it that we get? Well, Jesus promises a couple things in what we just read. First of all, Jesus promises salvation. He says to those who enter through him, they will be saved. Saved from what? I don't think we're running from wolves and lions. Um, but, but what Jesus is talking about is he's saying we will be saved from the lostness and the separation from the shepherd that is caused by our sin. We are saved from the lostness and the separation from the shepherd that is caused by our sin. Here's the deal. From the, from the very beginning, if you go back and you read Genesis, from the very beginning, we were meant to be his. We were meant to be the sheep of a loving shepherd who wanted relationship with his sheep, who wanted to be up and close and personal with people. He wanted to love and to care and to provide and to protect. But you see the story, what happens with Adam and Eve is they're given an option. They're given the choice. He doesn't force them to be his sheep. They choose, and what they choose is rather than, than trusting the leading of the shepherd, they decide they want to make their own way and, and, and lead themselves. And so in that moment, when they reject God as shepherd and they choose to lead themselves and go their own way, in that moment, that's when, when that closeness and that intimacy with the shepherd was broken. That was when sin came in. And from that point on, all of their descendants, that's what we were born into. But God decided to make a way. God sent Jesus to lay down his life, his very body on a cross to make payment for sin once and for all, and so that all who believe in him repent of their sins and surrender to the shepherd are welcomed in through Jesus Christ into his fold. That is what Jesus means, that we are saved through him. When we come to that point and we believe and we repent and we surrender and we come to God through Jesus, he becomes your shepherd. He becomes your protector. He becomes the one who heals your wounds. He's the one who leads you and guides you. We're promised salvation. But Jesus also promises abundant life. And that, if you were with us a couple weeks ago when we learned and Jesus said, I am the bread of life, life, it's that same word, it's zoe. It encompasses two things. It encompasses eternal life, the life that we have after this life on earth is over and we get to spend eternity with him in heaven, but it also encompasses the enjoying of the richness of a relationship with the shepherd in the here and now. It's abundant life with him. And I know, I've had people say to me, well, when you take the route, when you go through the door of Jesus to get to God, you just walk right into a super restricted life. There are all these boundaries, all these walls. That's not abundant life. In verse 9, Jesus gives us a little more of a clue of, of the abundant life he's talking about. He says, if anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Now, in the going in, we're talking about the going through the door of Jesus into the sheepfold, right? Into that safe 
enclosure. And the into brings safety and security, saved from sin, saved from hell, saved from death being the final word. But, but here's a question. Do you think if you sat down with a shepherd, a real shepherd who shepherds sheep, do you think he would say that, you know, a wise shepherd lets sheep just do and go wherever they want to go? Do you think they say, yeah, the sheep, the sheep know better than I do, so I just let them, you know, they, they just get to go do whatever they want. I trust. They know the way back. I don't think so. Um, I want to show you this video. I think it may have been shown at one of some other time, but it is too good to not show again because it pretty much speaks for itself in regard to sheep doing whatever they want to do. Can you show us this video? So that's a sheep in a hole and, you know. Aw, poor sheep. Yeah. Pretty much, that's us. Yeah. Yeah, let's see it. I'm glad God doesn't make us watch our, you know, jump in the hole in slow motion over and over and over again. But, but no shepherd is going to say, let the sheep do whatever. They know what's best. Does following the shepherd into the sheepfold mean that there are some boundaries? Yeah, because a good and loving shepherd cares about the well-being of the sheep, sees things that the sheep don't see, understands things that the sheep don't understand. And he always has their best in mind. So that's the going in. It's about being safe and secure with him. But there's also a going out. And just just to be clear, Jesus isn't saying, yeah, you get to go into the family of God and following God and being with God. And then you wander back out and you go back in and you wander out and it's no big deal. You walk in and out of belonging to God. That is not what he's talking about. That if you, if you think about it, anytime the sheep are leaving the sheepfold, who are they following? They don't leave without the shepherd. So it's not talking about leaving the family of God. It's, it's the going in with the shepherd and being with him in there because he knows that's the right time to be there. And then the sheep follow him out and he leads them beside still waters. He leads them to green pastures. He leads them through dark valleys and he leads them up onto mountaintops. He leads them to the places that are necessary to find the food that will strengthen them and keep them healthy and strong and growing. So the going in and the going out, the, the, the common denominator is the proximity of the shepherd. The common denominator is following the shepherd. It's trusting him. It's the, the reality that once you go in that door through Jesus, you trust he's the shepherd and he knows how to take care of you. And so you can trust him with whatever it is that may come. Now, culture that we live in right now, the day and age that we live in, I don't know if I'm the only one, but it, things seem to be getting darker and darker. And I think, and I've seen, um, as things get darker and more scary out in the world, God's sheep would like to be led into the safety of the sheepfold and lock the door and hide away from the big dark world until Jesus just comes back to get us. Here's the problem with that is that when God's church, when God's people build walls and hide together and shut the door, what happens often is we shut out those who are trying to find a way in. 
and we forget that we're the ones that God has put in the world to show people the way to the door. In John chapter 17, Jesus prays a prayer and it's recorded. John the apostle records this prayer. And and Jesus is praying for his disciples because Jesus knows he's getting ready to leave them. He's going to give his life on the cross. He's going to be resurrected and then he's going back to heaven. And so he prays this prayer for his disciples. But, but I want you to know that in that prayer, he says, I'm not just praying for these ones. I'm actually praying for everybody who will believe in me because of the message that they preach. So that means us too. So look at what Jesus prays and think about it in terms of of you know, when we're wrestling with this dark world and we're in this world, but I'd like to just be around these safe sheep and not be in the world and just listen to this. This is Jesus praying. I've given them your word and the world hates them because they do not belong to the world just as I do not belong to the world. I'm not asking that you take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to this world any more than I do. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world. If that prayer was for us too, think about it. Jesus said, I'm sending you into the world. Just like the father sent me. I'm sending you into the world. I am sending you into the world. There are so many people who are wandering, who are searching, who are out there on their own fending for themselves. Many of them are looking, they're searching for a way to happiness. They're searching for a way to feel safe. They're searching for a way and a place to belong. They're searching for God, even if they don't know it yet. And here's my question. Here's my question, not just to you, but to me as well. Here's my question. Am I creating pathways for others to find the door to God? Does my life create pathways for people to find Jesus? 50 years ago, I think most, any person you talk to probably had some connection to God in some way. Whether, even if they didn't serve God or really follow God, maybe they went to church. Maybe their grandma went to church. Maybe they prayed in school every morning and even memorized a Bible verse. Every, most people, I won't say everybody, but most people had some, some idea. You could say David and Goliath and probably everybody knew what you were talking about. Now we've got a whole generation that is growing up who don't know who God is. Many don't know who Jesus is. You say David and Goliath and they don't know what you're talking about. And so so we have to think a little different about lighting the way to the door than maybe we did 10, 20, 30, 50 years ago. I actually think we need to start thinking more like missionaries. We need to start thinking like people who who are living in a foreign country, a foreign culture. We belong to the kingdom and the culture of God, and we live in a place that is not our culture. So how do we make pathways for people to find the door in the dark that we live in? Here are, are two simple ways. First of all, seek the good of your community. 
If you look at Jesus' life, often, often, he cared for people's physical needs first. Then he spoke to them about what was going on in their heart. Seek the good of your community. It makes me think of in Jeremiah 29, the, the people of God have been exiled. They've been taken out of their home and placed into a hostile culture, a hostile, evil culture that worships all kinds of gods and does all kinds of horrible things. And this is where God's people are exiled. And God sends a word to them through the prophet Jeremiah. Look at, look at what God says. He says, seek the welfare of the city where you've been sent into exile. Pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. It makes me think about Matthew chapter 5 where Jesus says, let your light shine before other people so that they see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. It's not enough just to care about people in your heart. Jesus says, let them see the good things that you're doing so that they see the goodness of God. Let them see the love of God in your life. Do good in your community and people will find a way to Jesus. And here's the other thing. Love people, but love them up close. What do, what do I mean by that? Well, Jesus was really clear. That, that loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength um, was the first thing, our first priority, but right up there with it was to love people. Loving people is really essential to loving Jesus and loving God. And, and here's my question for us. How can we be an expression of his love to those who don't yet know him if we don't have any relationships with people who don't know him. And, and I don't think that it's God's heart to have the mindset, oh, here's this person who doesn't know God, so I'm gonna be their friend. And when they don't respond right away with a positive reception about Jesus and Christianity, we say, oh, well, okay, I'll move on to the next. We've got to think like a missionary. We need to build relationships with people who are searching for God over a long period of time. Do you know how they're going to see the faithfulness of God when we're faithful? Do you know how they're going to see the love of God when we love? Do you know how they're going to see the kindness of God when we're kind? Who are the people that God has put in your life that your life is supposed to light a pathway to Jesus? Your boss, your coworkers, your friends, your neighbors, your family. Who has God put in your life? We're never the door. We're never the door. Don't ever carry the responsibility that you save anybody. That's Jesus <laughs> and only Jesus. But we are called the light, the way to Jesus. And here's the other thing. The offer, you know, Jesus said that, that he came to seek and save the lost. He said that it is God's desire that none would perish. This offer to walk through the door of Jesus and become one of God's people, that offer is open to everybody. Jesus in Revelation chapter 3, he uses the door um, in a different way 
the illustration of a door and he says this, he says, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him. He's talking about the door to your life, the door to your heart. I stand at the door and I knock. If you're hearing my voice calling to you, open your heart to me, open your life to me and I'll come.